And here we are casting a teleport tablet to pet med number three, where we're gonna go ahead and unstash all of the code that I previously stashed and look over that. And then finally, we will be able to get back to new code. So um, like I said, it, it's been a few weeks since I've looked at this code. So it's gonna be just about as new for y'all as it is for me. So let's go ahead and get right to it. So, um, like I said, I did stash this code with git stash. So we do have some uncommitted code that we are now gonna boop, pop. And so um, it looks like there was a good bit of work that I did do. I think I started defining most of the queries I needed to get like a user registered and started. And then I had some auth code underway. So let's go ahead and check out basically all of the new files thus far. So we've got some login middleware here. Um, we'll take a look at that further in a minute, just because we have to have our user queries, you know, defined first in order to actually use that login request. Um, so yeah, let's go take a look. Let's see. We've got just kind of some index routers set up. That way we can have our like import export structure defined. Um, so we technically don't have any API routes yet. So everything really is just dealing with authentication. Got it. All right. For our user routes, or sorry, our user queries here, um, we really don't need more, much more than this. Later, I probably will have some account or a query that does allow a user to toggle their verification status. That way, once we do undergo the email verification, a user can just click the um, you know, link in the email and we'll have them auto update their account that way. But for now, we are just allowing a user to register, providing a name, email, password, image, URL, and then we pass that into our database. And since we are running an insert and I did wanna make this as MySQL-esque as possible, I did specify returning ID in this clause here. And that way we would return, you know, an object in our returned rows property with an ID property within it. And that way we will know the ID of the item that we just created, that user that we just registered. So. Our database is auto-generating UUIDs for us, which is really nice. And we can have that info bounced back. We might have like a profile page that we redirect our users to on the client side. Maybe, you know, we will have some use for that on this app. After that, we also have this query find that allows us to find a user by their email effectively. So um, that's what we need to log in. For households, I don't have anything yet, but that kind of will be some consequential action to a user registering. You know, they register for their account in order to start creating some pets and getting everything linked up. They need to define a household. So it's kind of a very closely coupled feature to a user registration. So that's gonna kind of fall next in line. And then finally in the database folder, in addition to having this queries folder structure where we will be writing all of our later future queries, which there's gonna be a lot. We have a lot of tables, a lot of interconnected action. Um, we have this index file here. And the reason why we have this index file is basically to daisy chain our imports up. Just give us a much nicer way of accessing all of our queries just because having to reference like import foo from dot dot slash db slash query slash foo it's just kind of tedious and uh especially if we've got a lot of routes to define a lot of controllers to define so it, it's just a lot nicer having this daisy chained up but we now have the ability to register a user and find a user and if we have the ability to find a user we can use that for logging in so we don't have any auth code per se defined yet, but we do have a login middleware um, that I did call is valid user. So what we're doing with this is making sure that the user does pass in the email and password. And then if both of those are provided in the request, we then try to find that user in the database 
And if we don't, that would be an empty array that gets returned and destructuring something out of an empty array yields undefined. So if user is undefined here, which we can do with a quick truthiness check, if not user, we 401 them, just given a very generic invalid credentials. And then if we get beyond that point, we know that user does exist. And therefore we are able to, you know, see with bcrypt if their password does match up with what is hashed and salted. And if it does not, then we return the exact same response as before. And that way, if somebody's just doing like a quick, like low key brute force on some random credentials they found um, on a very small scale, then they don't know if it's a valid email or an invalid email and invalid password together. They just know that the combo they presented with is invalid. So I'll do that. And otherwise, um, what I'm gonna do is basically the only information that I'm gonna be encoding in our token is the ID and the user's name itself. So that's really all I'm doing um, for the token payload itself. And so that's all I'm going to carry on into the request user here. So let me go ahead and before we continue defining any other auth code, let me go ahead and create Oh, cool. Well, a payload uh, interface. So I've already got one defined. That's what I was coming over here to do. And I also do hijack expresses request type to add a user property whose type is that of payload. So, you know, go figure. Already got that coded out. Good job, past me. Future me or present me thanks you. So um, back to our login middleware. So, yeah. Um, great. That means that we can pass this info into the actual login route once this user's done, where we can then generate a token. And in the event, you know, some kind of database error happened for some reason that is caught, and then we have just kind of a general error handler there. But we should intercept pretty much any other um, potential error here, like not having email or password. Well, that's intercepted. Not having a user with that email, we intercept that. Having that correct user but an incorrect password, we also you know handle that. So there shouldn't be too much wiggle room for an error here. All right. But now that we've got that login uh, middleware, let's actually go ahead and start defining some auth routes here. This app is going to get a little bit larger with its auth requests so you know right now we need a login and a register but later we're gonna have a verify and we probably will also have like an mfa functionality of some kind we also probably will have a magic link functionality of some kind and a password reset and a lot of those are kind of like tightly intercoupled but um for now, I will start off with the registration and the login logic in this index file. And as we need to expand later, we will. So first we need to register before we can log in. And we are gonna go ahead and import our database queries. Let's see. I also did create a little validator library um, with a handful of miscellaneous functions that I didn't export out yet. Um, but I definitely do want to utilize these in some kind of capacity. So we check to see if a value I provide is truthy, to see if something is explicitly not undefined to see if something is an array or is a string, or we have an is too short function, which takes a string and then a min and max length, which for the is too short, we can omit the max. And then same thing for is too long, we can omit the uh, minimum, but we'll destructure just those respective ones out. So is too long checks the string and the max length to ensure that String length is not greater than or equal to max, or same thing, but for the minimum for the is too short. Let's see. 
we've got this r good strings function which takes an array of strings um, or excuse me takes an array of these objects containing the string and its respective max and min and then it iterates over it and then instead of doing like an array dot sum just to say like you had a bad value um, what I've actually got is a mismatch object here and that's gonna let me um, take like every individual string in there and if a string has multiple criteria that fail um, Actually, this is kind of dumb. I don't know why I did it this way. <laughs> so, because like these are mutually exclusive conditions anyway. Like you can't have this one also match that one. And since we're returning early here, I mean, I guess that makes sense. Because like if a string is missing, it's also not going to, if something's undefined, it can't have a type of match for string matching. Well, yeah, this is dumb. I'm going to refactor this anyway. So I'm not using it currently. Nothing's exported out, but we are going to come back and do some much better validators later. So sorry that I am kind of jumping around a bit. Like I said, it's been a few weeks since I've touched this code. So it's effectively kind of like as new for me as it is for you. But let's go ahead, get some try catch logic up here. And then if error instance of the JavaScript error class itself. Man, I think I've already complained a bunch, maybe in this video series, maybe not, about how much I hate the JavaScript catch construct. It is so wild that you can throw anything in JavaScript. It is a terrible, terrible idea. Like, you should only be able to throw errors or classes that extend upon the error construct. It's just so silly all the workarounds we have to do to, to validate that something is an error object. Um, like, I don't want to have to check to see if something is an instance of just the base error class or if something is of the instance of, like, the Postgres error class or, or something like that. But I should also set up some kind of like global error handler instead of doing all of this over and over again. So that is a consideration for later Andrew to do as well. So for registering a user, we've got that new user type that we need to pull in. So for that, we need to extract out Name, email, password, and image URL, which is optional. So we're not going to validate that. Um, well, I've got a lot of strings. Let, let's go back here and run through our validators again. So. Um, we've got our mismatch object, which is keyed by each string itself. So, this structure is silly. Um, Here, I'm going to make mismatches an array and then loop over our vowels, destructuring out our string and max. 
And if a minimum value is not provided, we just default to one here, just ensuring we have something in the string, even though we are undergoing a truthiness check, or I will, to at least make sure that, you know, the string has some content, which the truthiness check, if a string has nothing in it, is falsy. So we effectively do validate with just a truthiness check that it has at least one item in it, but. So mismatches over here. If, let's see, not is string, which we can do, yeah, I was going to say we can do a, def a define check here, but you know, the is string function here will validate that if it's undefined, that should fail here. So if not is string, um, And well, that would be like undefined. So like what, what I want to do is like when I call string check, um, Maybe I should pass everything in instead of an array, an object where the string is actually the key of a, well, I don't know. Cause like what I want to do with the mismatches is be able to like provide info back to the user and be like, Hey, like this string is a string, but it is too short or it is too long. Or we could also check every string individually. Hmm. So like what I'm trying to do is like, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of string data in this app. So I basically just wanna be able to dump the rec body into a validator function without having to get like too granular. Uh... For now, let me just go ahead and do like an array.sum and I'll worry about returning um, like an array of mismatched values later. So we're, we're just gonna do a quick check here. Oh, and this is checking to see if are good strings, um, which means it needs to iterate over the entire array. Just make sure everything is good. I'm actually gonna flip the script here, make it a little more efficient and check to see if we have any bad strings. So instead of having to do like vals.every, an array.sum will exit early in the event it finds a matching condition. So if I have a million strings to check, <coughs> and the second one is invalid for some reason, I don't go through a million iterations, I stop at number two. So we have kind of like a premature exit um, possible with like a falsiness check there versus array.every, you know, I might check 999,999, um, but I still have to go all the way to the millionth just to ensure like every single value. So, you know, it, it's just kind of a slight little optimization thing, but. We'll change it to has bad strings and then we'll do array.sum and we'll return true if we have not a string or if is too short passing in the min or let's see oh that needs the string and the min. Oh, 
Oh, and string check said max is optional. Well, we're using it for multiple things, so I'm gonna make that minimum or optional. Let's see, is too long. Okay, so we'll deal with that for now. So if has bad strings, this array here. See, and for each object here, um, it actually needs to be an object in this array. So, string here will be name the max for that, min for that. Uh, let's go check our database setup. Users max is 64, min. We'll make one so we can leave that optional. Email, I think I made the max. One twenty eight on that. And then ugh. the min for an email. You could be lucky and have a two letter top level domain. So like .io, which I say lucky, but like you can get those if you're willing to pay like a few hundred bucks to buy one. And then they're not that expensive reoccurring, but you know, a at a dot io like at the very least like seven characters password here i mean we're gonna be salting and hashing it so like the max password i'll set up to be like 200 characters and i mean min 10 here i guess and then image url we are not actually going to check for that since it's not you know required all right we'll kind of assume that's good so here we can go ahead and await db.users.register then we will pass in the name email no password yet, image URL, because we need to salt and hash that password. All right, so const hashed is equal to await bcrypt, which I don't have imported here. dot hash the plain text password and we'll undergo two to the twelfth amount of rounds then image URL it's gonna be image URL or null oh whoops yeah it allows it to be undefined so you can leave it like that all right, so we've got some validators set up. We are validating our user accounts. We are hashing and salting our password. And now we are going to send all of that info to the database. And then we will actually get, since we're doing that, um, 
you know, returning ID at the end of our register query, we should get a user object back with the ID, that UUID that was just created. So, um, and I even named it insert ID. So I know that's a MySQL like specific property, but I just like the structure of the MySQL return type. So I'm just making my version of the PG library, my like wrapper function around that to handle it in that way. So here, um, we'll go ahead and get the ID out with results.insertID. And then we are going to go ahead and, well, I was gonna say generate a token. Um, we are gonna be dealing with setting up like email based authentication in order to like register a user. So later I actually don't want to auto log in our users, but getting everything started, I will. And this is just something that we will be removing at a later point. So let's go ahead and also import our payload type and the JSON web token library. which I don't have installed. So let's go do that. npm i json web token and npm i dash d to add it to my dev dependencies, the types for json web token. And as it does that, we're gonna go back to Lumbridge really quickly so I can add in some stuff to my environment variables. Adding in my JWT secret and adding in my expiration there as well, which I'm gonna do as like 10 minutes just because this is development. I want short-lived tokens just to validate that, you know, once everything expires, that um, we do have everything correctly rejecting everything. I don't know why, these are local credentials, so I don't know why we teleported back to, I said Lumbridge, um, now we're back in Lumbridge. These are local credentials, so I could have shown my ENV, um, oh well. And naturally, I trust nobody, especially myself most of all, for putting the right variable names in place. So I am grabbing my JSON web token or JSON web token expiration um, properties from my ENB and pasting them here. And that way I can type of them. Now, an annoying thing with that I wish TypeScript could infer correctly and pick up on is if I could, you know, crash the application here in the event these environment variables were undefined, I wish it would be able to infer in other files that the value of that should be a string, but unfortunately it can't. Now I, I can do something like Let's see. I'm gonna create an interface here called config object. And a config object is just gonna be an object with a bunch of string keys and a bunch of string or undefined values aka like most objects with, you know, differing data types. Um, all right. And I will return, if I can spell that correctly, object.values, config object converts all of the values into an array. So, 
my secret and my expiration become strings in an array. So purely an array of whatever their values are. And if I mistyped one of these, we would have undefined in there. So object.values config object is giving us an array that we can do array.sum on. And I call the function name has undefined values yet again, because we're doing some here. We're just returning early in the event we find, you know, a failing value, which for us, we're checking to see if some value is undefined. And so if it does, has undefined values, returns true. And now we've got this nifty little validator. I can say like, if has undefined values, you know, JWT, like crash the app. Bunch of new lines. And so my code beyond this point should understand that, hey, I am actually crashing the app in the event these environment variables are missing. So like we should know that this should be a secret, um, or if I like threw an error here, I think if I throw an error here, it should infer that it's a string. No, if we're in the same like function block, yes, that would work. Um, but even if we were, it's still not gonna be able to parse that in an external file, which is kind of annoying. So one thing that I do is I just kind of grin and bear it and crash the app, logging out, you know, what we're missing. And then I just, when it's necessary, cast this as a string. And so TypeScript thinks outside of this file, jwt.secret is only ever a string. And we shouldn't ever do this unless we are also validating that, you know, it's not undefined, but um, I'm just setting that up quickly to, you know, one, have safe runtime code, but to also have it described correctly-ish to TypeScript. So now, we are creating a an object here called payload whose type has, well, and in this instance for an insert, you know, insert ID would be, um, would exist. I did say the re results like return type has insert ID as an optional property because you are for the metadata, not always getting an insert ID, kind of just like with MySQL, like it's optional, but here I'll just do a quick, like, um, non-null assertion operation with TypeScript. Now that we've got our payload, let's go ahead and create a token. So we'll do jwt.sign and then we'll import our config directory and then uh, we'll pass in our payload as what we want to encode. Then we'll sign the token with jwt dot sign, or sorry, config dot jwt dot secret. And we'll set the expiration time with expires in, then config dot jwt dot expiration. All right. So we'll send up a 201 here, indicating that we had a user get created in the database. I'm gonna send up a message property saying user registered successfully. I will bounce the ID back and I will also bounce the token back. So our registration logic is now done, thankfully. Let's go ahead and create our login logic router.login, router.post to slash login. 
async rec res, boom, boom. Try catch. I'm gonna copy my error handling from the previous block of code. Like I said, this app is gonna scale up pretty decently in size, so I will later be probably creating a global error handler. So we can just say like next error and just have this, you know, general stuff dumped out a little more easily. Um, Cause like right now I'm just saying like an error occurred while X, please try again later. You know, not really anything fancy or special there. And then we'll pull in the is valid user middleware and apply that to this login request. So by the time we get here, rec.user is populated with our user's ID and name. So we can destructure those out. And then conveniently enough, well, that's exactly what we need to sign in a token. So, um, const token is equal to JWT dot sign. What info? That info. Secret is config dot JWT dot secret. And then the expiration time. And just like that, a user attempting to log in is logged in. So 200 here. I'm not gonna bounce the ID back because we're logging in, you know, the user's ID is understood already. All right, so that actually should get us up and running. Um, that is a very famous, dangerous last word of mine, but let's go ahead and see if my dev script even runs. Cool, that's good, our server is live. Um, now let's go ahead and create a Postman collection, which may be the slowest application to launch. All right. So I'm creating a new collection for PetMed. I'm gonna create some folders. Let's see, add folder. I like documenting my API paths, which is very, very um, weird, but I like it a lot. It just makes it very easy to read my collections if you're somebody importing this. It's just easier to show the API structure versus having a bunch of like top level flattened requests. Just it's a lot nicer. So we're gonna make a login route and a register route. All right, we've got a URL for registering and then one for logging in. Now for registering, we're gonna be using Postman's Faker.js integration to give me some good fake data. And I feel like I'm missing something. Um, let's see, are my API paths linked up? Yes. No, not for my server at least. Do I even have a JSON body parser? No, I don't. All right. So we're importing our routes folder index and then we'll get that linked up. App.use routes. I'm sorry, router is what I named it, the variable. 
All right, so we've got our JSON body parser. Our server now is linking to our router index, which links to our child indices, API and auth, which our auth index, I'm just kind of doing everything live on that until you know we need to expand. So um, we need for registering a name property. And I'm gonna use Postman's random full name. Email is gonna be the random email. And the way in which you can use these fake variables with Postman is anywhere you can put a string, um, you'll encapsulate two curly braces, must mustache syntax, and a dollar sign, and then you'll get to see all of the faker JS variables they've exposed. And actually, for the password, I uh, don't know what you know. Uh, I don't want to lose the user forever because it was a randomized password. So everybody's going to be using Hunter two for now, and then I will just not provide an image URL, or I will but I'll leave it as an empty string. So we should be able to, crap. <laughs> um, I'm failing validation for something, why? Name, email, password, max, 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 minimum, min. Oh, the minimum password length, whoops. I mean, they're getting salted in hash, so I guess theoretically I could leave it as one. Um, you know, it's not good practice for your users, but it could just be one, so. There we go. Got my user's ID and a token bounced back which we could look in the database for the user's info, or we can just decode the token and, oh, you know what? I uh, I don't have the email in the token. I just have the name and the ID. So we actually do need to look at the database for that to test out the login. But we do have registration going successfully, which is great. And then we should be able to log in, in theory. So I'll go ahead and start defining the body as um, Beekeeper Studio opens up. Password here, I will leave as Hunter2. And then Let's go look at my users table. Let's see. Trevion Reynolds at yahoo.com. We'll copy that, come over here, paste it. And then let me change the password to Hunter3. Let's make sure that login check is failing correctly. We should get a 401 with a message saying invalid credentials, which we do. Excellent. What about if we have a bad email? We should get the exact same response. 401 and valid credentials. And now we should be able to get a token back. Cool, all right. Well, now we have some validation logic in place. Um, we've got some authentication in place. We can actually log in as a user, which is great because, I mean, we all see the, you know, crazy amount of strings I've got here. The users table is the one right there. There's a lot of interconnected functionality. Lots of stuff is key to the users table. We really cannot use the app without users. So us being able to get to the point where we can register a user and also validate that user is pretty critical. Um, 
One final thing that I do need to do is maybe have a token validation check here. So let's do a quick little token check middleware. We'll import the request handler type from Express. All right. And the request handler type auto types a function as an express request handler, meaning the request response and next objects are all preemptively typed. He says, looking over, realizing he is not looking at the code, but instead himself. Um, so I'm creating a new middleware here for token check. And I have that function here defined as a request handler, which means that, you know, express has this typed as an express request response and next um, object. So it's a little more convenient than typing those individually. But all right, so we will check for the existence of an off header. And if not off header, we're going to return res.status. Sorry, res.status 401.json message. Missing authentication headers. All right. So then after we get our auth header validated that it exists, we're going to split it up on the space. So if it is a bearer token with the token being a JWT, um, we are going to get an array of, well, the word bearer and the word, you know, token here. So that lets us easily break both of them out. And then if we want to, we can make sure that if the type is not bearer or if not token or if not type. Now, technically, um, I guess somebody could send an empty space as their auth header. Um, Cause like if they don't send it at all, you know, it obviously fails the truthiness check. So I suppose they could have an empty space and then some text. So if they just had an empty space first and then some text, um, type would actually be an empty string first. So yeah, I do want to validate that. Oh, and this would fail. I'm doing a lowercase string check here, but I'm not checking for a lowercase string. Um, Okay, I, I can never remember um, substring. It includes the characters up to, but not including the index. So zero to two would be index positions one and two. So in the event that the first two characters of the token are not EY, we will Say like incorrect authentication presented. There we go. But beyond that, we should have a JWT. So we can then undergo um, a check to you know validate everything. So we need to import the JSON web token library again. And we also need to import our config so we can get our JWT password.
and then um, what we're going to do is run jwt.verify passing in the token and then passing in our signature config.jwt.secret and we'll cast this I try to avoid casting as much as possible, but we need to to uh, overwrite the verify type since it doesn't take a generic for some reason. Um, yeah, for some reason I, I can't pass a generic verify callback. The verify callback might, yeah, but I don't want to use the callback structure. So um if we did use the callback structure we could give a generic there but i'm not doing that so if it doesn't have um, the callback in the event the token's invalidated it's going to throw an error which we'll just catch and say you know invalid token but otherwise our payload is going to be the you know object with the user's you know, ID and name in it. So we extract that out of the token and we can inject that into the rec.user and then call next. And then let me see how I exported this out. Okay, a named constant for that. We will make a named constant for this middleware as well. And now we've got this token check, making sure that we must be logged in in the event um, we have a route to protect. So let me make one final check here under the auth umbrella. All right, not really a, a you know big route here, but I just want to have a request that I can make any type of request to. I, I should probably just make that git, and then um, it runs through token check. And if I have a bad token or missing in you know missing auth headers or just anything bad for any reason, well, it's going to go ahead and fail that and send out a response prematurely. But otherwise, if we make it beyond this point, we can send a good status code, an implicit 200, with like a little smiley face as the message. The message doesn't matter, it's the status code, the healthy response that does. So, let's go ahead and make a request to check my token. And then that route is slash auth slash check underscore token. Now for this, I don't have any auth headers. We are deriving everything from the parent folder auth, which is deriving it from PetMed, which I haven't set up any auth on the folder itself. So we're gonna get missing authentication headers. Now, if I set that up manually myself and say bearer token, and I just leave the token off altogether, we will get you know, a new error, although that's saying missing authentication headers. Check token, token check. We should be getting this unless if Postman says, hey, that, oh, you know what? Yeah, so Postman is actually doing this. If you try to send a bearer token, but you don't actually send a token, if you look at the headers here, it's actually not sending that at all. So if I send an empty space here as my argument, you'll see here it does actually add that. So here I should get the other one, incorrect authentication type presented. And then finally, if I do make a token or I pretend like I've got one, you know, we do a quick check here just to make sure the header at least starts with the EY before we run through JWT dot, you know, verify. And then once we bypass these checks here, 
We try to JWT verify that garbage string. It throws an error, which we just say invalid token for. So all of that is working successfully. And now let's actually go get a legit token that my server actually signed. I'll paste that here. We will hit send. I will hit save. We will hit send. Why is that failing? Did I do a really short-lived token? Let me add the error here in the response just to see what it's saying. Okay, yeah. So I, I did actually make a very short-lived token. So I do need to re-log in as that user. Get a fresh token. So hey, we know that my short-lived tokens are working the way they should. And then there we go, we hit our smiley face. So we know that if our token expires, token check does invalidate the uh, request. So cool. Um, we have a majority of our authentication scaffolding in place. So um, beyond this point, you know, it's no longer us just kind of doing a little overview of code and then some live coding. We are now, you know, all live coding from this point on outwards. So yeah, let's see where this series takes us. But at this point, We've got our database connection set up. We've got some queries to find. We can register as a user, log in as a user. We've got our you know, token checking middleware in place. So we're in pretty good standing to start continuing the rest of our you know, backend development, which is just gonna be writing a lot of queries and a lot of routes. But you know, bit by bit, we are slowly getting there. So anyway, thanks for sticking with me through this. Um, it's been a good one. It's going to be a great series. Go ahead and subscribe to our channel if you're not to get more of this. But until then, I'll see you in episode four.